Pharma Ventures, experts in deals and alliances. Hello and welcome to Pharma Ventures Insight here in Cologne, Germany. On today's show, I have Matthew Dancy of Amplify. Matthew, welcome. Thank you. Um, Amplify, uh, I can't tell what you are from the name, so perhaps you could tell us a little bit about your company. Yeah, so we're a bacteriophage company that's focused on infectious diseases. The name Amplify actually comes from the way that bacteriophage work. So when bacteriophage infect bacteria, they hijack the protein production machinery within the bacteria and they amplify themselves um, so that you produce many more of these bacteriophage. We, then the bacterial cell is actually lysed and it releases all of this bacteriophage into the surrounding areas that go on to productively infect additional bacteria. Right. So that's interesting approach. I mean, ev- right. traditionally, anti-infectives have been a chemical approach and you've yes. come at it from a completely different angle. Um, how, how did you get to that point? Yeah, so it's actually a fairly old technology. It's something that's been around, you know, since the 20s, but uh, they haven't necessarily applied the scientific rigor that was necessary to bring it into the, you know, modern uh, healthcare practice. And so that's what we're doing. We're taking these phages and we've assembled them into cocktails um, so that we can get a broad coverage within a very specific bacterial species. We um, are now in phase one trials. We've read out two top line results for phase ones this year, and we'll be moving into another phase one in 2017, as well as an additional phase two in 2017. Right. The obvious question, and you, you talked about the sort of mechanism there of the, the, the bacteriophage amplifies and then the cell lyses and gets released. Uh, I'm a patient. It, the, the phages get released. Is that, is that a problem for me? So, you know what the great thing about phages is they, um, they don't infect mammalian cells. So they are specific for bacterial cells. So, you know, from a safety perspective, they're very safe. And once there's no bacterial cells for them to actually infect, they're just naturally eliminated throughout your body. So phages have actually been around in bacteria and phages. There's this predator-prey relationship that's been going on for eons. So this has, you know, existed prior to humans. So we've evolved alongside phages and bacteria. So inside of you, you've got, you know, billions of phages, you know, currently, and, you know, since you've evolved alongside of them, we believe, and so far what we've seen, is that, you know, they're, they're very, very safe and well tolerated. So in fact, are they, are they actually even safer than the chemistry approach? Because clearly there you're putting a poison of, of, of sorts mm-hmm. into uh, patients to kill, kill the, the, the bacteria, which is going to have to be metabolized by the liver and, and removed by the kidneys with maybe some collateral damage along the way, but right. you save the patient. Are, are these safer than that? You know, I would, I would venture a guess that they, they would be safer. You know, that's, that's, that's our perspective. You know, that'll obviously bear out as we move into, you know, more advanced clinical trials with larger patient numbers. But based on what we've seen so far in the phase one trials, as well as, you know, anecdotal experience, as well as some of the compassionate use cases that we've actually been involved in, um, they are very safe. Right. Um, you said you're, you've done two phase ones already and you've got a third one coming up. Are you targeting particular infections or uh, is, is this a, a pan-infection approach? Right. So our first molecule or our first uh, cocktail is targeting uh, Staph aureus. Mm-hmm. So we have broad coverage within Staph aureus. We include MRSA, VERSA, um, so sort of the entire range of Staph, what we consider, you know, all the clinically relevant isolates. We hit about, you know, 95% plus. So, you know, that's very similar and, you know, if not better than some antibiotics that target staph. But at the same time, you know, we don't have the collateral damage Mm. that you experience throughout the body. So that first indication we're going to move into is in chronic rhinosinusitis. So these are patients that have, you know, terrible sinus infections. So chronic rhinosinusitis is characterized by having, um, you know, symptoms that last for 12 weeks or more. So this isn't your, you know, run-of-the-mill sinus infection. This Mm -hmm. is serious. Uh, the patients that we're going after in that phase one, that we went after in the phase one, and that we will be going after in the phase two, are all post-surgery. So it's a fairly invasive procedure. Mm-hmm. They go up, they sort of clear out everything in your sinuses, um, and about 20% of the patients that actually have that procedure, the infection rebounds. So the phase one was designed to go after patients where that infection is rebounded. Um, we've taken endoscopic images to make sure there's an active infection. We then culture that infection outside um, and make sure that it is staph. We then take the extra step of making sure that that infection is sensitive to our cocktail. 
So even though it's a phase one study and you know the primary endpoint is safety, you know, we're hoping to glean certain signals of efficacy based upon these endoscopic images before and after bacterial load reduction and then some uh, qualitative uh, patient symptom scores. Right, so you, you're actually aiming at, at being a, a first-line treatment if, in, in certain patient populations, which is different from other companies approaching here's a new antibiotic where they, mm -hmm. they become the next antibiotic of last resort. Absolutely. So you're different from that. Yeah, so we, you know, in, in the CRS, in the chronic sinusitis population, we're going to be targeting, you know, going into patients that have had these infections rebounded. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at it as being a first line and treatment. Is that a huge population of patients? Or is it yeah, so, you know, it's pretty astounding. Mm. About 12% of the U.S. population, or U.S. adult population, suffers from chronic rhinosinusitis in any given year. There's about 300 to 400,000 of these sinus surgeries just in the U.S. alone, and then 20% of those patients their infections rebound. So it's a, it's a, it's a pretty vast uh, market. Right. Does that translate into a, a viable economic model? Because the problem with anti-infectives is they cure the patient and they don't need to take the drug anymore. So, right. and, and you can't achieve the price points that this, this is an age-old problem. So do, do you get away from that with, with well, this? Well, you know, it, f and from a reimbursement perspective, mm -hmm. that's always a question that's going to be, you know, it's going to be sort of at the forefront of the discussion um, when it comes to, you know, antimicrobial treatments. Um, I think you know there might have to be some change changes in the way that reimbursement is actually approached, um, but you know these are very sick patients that you know currently don't have uh, a therapy that helps them. These you know there's no approved drug for chronic rhinosinusitis. Um, antibiotics are used, but you know there's not a huge amount of uh, vascularization mm -hmm. to allow the antibiotics to actually get where they need to go. So with the phage, we can actually. Um, we use a nasal wash, and this is part of their standard of care. They actually use a saline wash because they've been doing this. You know, they've suffered from this infections for many, many, mm -hmm. many years. So we have a forced nasal wash. It's sort of like a neti pot, except it's a you know a squeeze bottle. Mm -hmm. So we actually just put our phages in there, and they squeeze it up into one nostril, and then they also squeeze it up into the other nostril. So we get pretty you know good administration, and uh, you know that we believe you know it's hitting the right targets. Where, where will you take it next after this, assuming this is successful and you, and you get this through and, and into the marketplace, what, what's next for, for the company? So the next uh, program that we're going after is a pseudomonas focused co cocktail, and that's going to be in the CF population. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be, you know, hoping to not only, you know, the current standard of care for cystic fibrosis is, you know, cycling on and off of antibiotics. What we're looking to do is not just tamp down and keep that infection at bay. We're looking to eradicate it. Right. Will, will the phages, because a lot of the problem in, in CF is there's, there's the mucus and the non-moving mucus and you can't actually get anti-infectives mm -hmm. through, do, do, do phages overcome that? Yeah, so phages actually uh, have a great ability to motor through biofilms. Right. Um, so the phages that we have, you know, we, we can see that they do very well in biofilms. Um, and, you know, phages, they've evolved to be very good at being the predators of bacteria. So in, in that respect, they can, you know, overcome some of these uh, resistant mechanisms that, bact that bacteria have presented to antibiotics. And, you know, antibiotics are a static, you mm. know, chemical antibiotics are a static um, treatment. With phages, you can see this as a dynamic option um, that could provide, you know, a disease-modifying therapy because, you know, it's going to be able to go, move, move through the biofilm and, you know, attack these pseudomonas bugs and deplete the population. Right. So just um, turning to the company for a while, how, mm -hmm. how is the company funded? So we're a public company. We're listed on the NYSE market. Um, you know, we've got some great long-term investors um, that have been around for, for a while. Mm -hmm. And, and the long-term future for the business, would you, would you look to be acquired at some point, or do you, do you have a vision for the future there? So, you know, we are moving and we are open to, you know, all options, um, whether or not that's a co-development deal or, you know, a partnership deal with Big Pharma. Um, it's just about finding that right fit and in finding, you know, the company who's dedicated to a novel uh, approach to uh, anti-infectives. But ultimately you'll look to commercialize with a, with a partner who has the sales and the infrastructure that goes with it. Yeah, I would think so. 
well, we'll look out for some, some interesting news. And as you, you roll that forward and, and take it into other areas, it sounds like a fascinating approach. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, you for joining us today. Cheers. Pharma Ventures, experts in deals and alliances.